Better System Trader, episode 32. Welcome to Better System Trader, the podcast to help systematic traders of all levels improve their trading. We'll give you loads of expert tips and practical advice on system design and validation, money management, trading psychology, and many other topics. Whether you're just starting out or a savvy systematic trader, we're here to help you improve your trading and find more success. This is Better System Trader with your host, Andrew Swanscott. Welcome to the Better System Trader Podcast. This is episode 32, and I'm your host, Andrew Swanscott. This week's guest is Laurent Bernieu. Laurent was a systematic short seller with Fidelity for eight years, and his mandate was to underperform the longest bear market in modern history, Japanese equities. Prior to that, he worked in the hedge fund world for five years, and he now runs an automated forex strategy and travels the world with his family. In this week's episode, we talk all about short selling, creating short strategies, and the challenges of implementation and managing risk. We also discuss the importance of exits, insights into bear markets, order trading forex, and why complexity is a form of laziness. So let's get to it. I hope you enjoy this week's chat with Laurent Bernieu. Hi, Laurent. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, Can we please start with uh, some background on yourself? Uh, uh, good morning, Andrew. Thank you very much for the interview. I mean, I'm, I'm honored to be among, uh, among so, such prestigious guests. So very grateful for the, for the podcast and for the opportunity. Sure. All right. Um, well, um, my name is Laurent Bernou. I'm from New Caledonia. I, st- I've been, I lived 22 years in Japan. Started off as a CPA. So I was an accountant at a Japanese company, Consolidation and Transfer Pricing and all this. And in 2001, I joined finance because there was a shortage of people who could understand Japanese accounting principles and explain them to foreigners. It was the time of Enron, Taiko, and all these. Uh, so I, I joined the sales side as a strategist. And in 2003, I joined the hedge fund world. So I've been in the alternative space for since 2003. Um, over there, I built some portfolio management system. Um, then in 2007, I thought, okay, probably time to go a bit more institutional, and I joined Fidelity as a dedicated short seller. So my mandate for the past eight years was to underperform the longest bear market in history. As far as I know, this is a truly unique skill set. I mean, no one has ever been dumb enough to ever do it again or to take on the world's <laughs> bear market. So, <laughs> I learned a couple of things out of that. And um, n- noticeably, I mean, we did everything. We did our options, equities, uh, option of a writing, calendar, moving strangle. I mean, simple stuff, really. But some more complicated stuff, too. And in 2011, I decided to um, start testing strategies because I was tired of the feast and famine. So I embarked on an odyssey, and let me tell you how long it lasted. I have it on the computer. 3,693 hours of programming on Wealthlab primarily, and on MetaTrader then and other platforms. So this thing has truly consumed my life, writing strategies. I nearly burned the house twice because I forgot that there was something on the on the, on the stove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sure can consume me, can't it? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, but I mean, it's because of the of the specialty that I have to do, like underperforming the longest bear market. That I had to develop strategies specifically for that. And it's fairly different from, from I mean, there's commonalities with what I've heard of with other people, but it's fairly different. It's actually quite radically different. Mm-hmm. So I had to develop strategies from the short side. And like any, I mean, most people, when they develop strategies, they try to develop, they, they focus on the egg, on the entry. Now, I mean, when would you like to get to shuffle medals? Before the race starts or after the race is completed? And... Markets are the only only competitive sports where people want to shuffle medals before the race starts. They all focus on stock picking. So 80% of the energy is concentrated on picking the right stocks, picking the right stocks. And year in, year out, 80% of the managers underperform their benchmark. Now, this has two interesting 
very two interesting probab probabilities properties. One of them is called high correlation. 80% of the people focus on entry and 80% of the people on the perform. And the second thing is called causality, higher R square. So the, my belief is actually, if you look at the trading hedge, trading hedge is another word for gain expectancy. It's the win rate times the average win minus the loss rate times the average loss. Now, where is entry in there? It's nowhere there. On the other hand, if you focus on exit, then you have already, you can move the needle. Mm. But um, again, about developing, so the way I look at strategies and the way I had to develop them because um, trading from the short side is very unforgiving. I mean, any mistake will be fatal. It's not about if, it's just about when. So when is the only time when we know if we made money is after we close the trade. And it really dawned me upon when I started designing strategies, I was focusing on the entry, but I realized that, wait, if I take care of the exit, then the entry is just a sliding scale probability behind it. So it's not very difficult. I'll give you a very simple example. I mean, for instance, we program on MetaTrader and uh, the stuff that I do is trend following basically, but it's a scale out scaling. And simply by changing a condition when we move from, when we change regime from bear to bull, there was a bug in there and uh, we exited as soon as we found the regime, but now, we exit a short as we find a low and we exit a long as we find a high and simply changing that exit condition to avoid a stop loss and so on force just changing this bumped the the win rate by five percent so wow. we jumped from 58 percent to 63 64 mm. so that enabled us to move like to move a, a periodicity from 15 to five minute and still maintain that high win rate so it enables compounding and so on and so forth. If I can just jump back to the the short side process for a minute, because that was um, your job in a previous role, but it now feeds into your system development process that you build on the short side first and then the long side. So can you explain the benefits of doing that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, um, of course. I mean, the short side is uh, is the hardest side. Like, it, But if it's more volatile, there's there's uh, the volume is thinner and there are technicalities like for instance the aptic rule or the need to borrow stocks or you have to pay dividend so all in all it's much more demanding and besides i mean sc uh, stocks they, they go up the escalator and they, and they jump off the window yeah. so <laughs> you have to catch that. it's very difficult and also something that i thought was a handicap but as in everything i mean um as the great Chinese philosopher Bruce Lee said, be like water, my friend. So I thought that the hardest part was the short squeeze because the probability of a short squeeze, and this is a defining thing for shorts that doesn't really exist for longs, the probability of a short swing is 100%. It will happen. So if you want a short, it's not when you, when you stumble upon an idea that you should short. If you know that a short squeeze is coming, just wait until it comes flushes everybody out, and then you can walk in. As a matter of fact, back in, I think it was in 08 or 09, I developed a, uh, a routine called squeeze box. Guess what it did? <laughs> <laughs> so every time I show a short squeeze, I was getting long on the on stocks and then then took the other, then uh, went long and then short thereafter. Mm -hmm. I dismantled that program when I realized that actually I was hurting my, my friends who were also in hedge fund world, I was hurting them by, by with this program. So I thought it was not not really a cool thing to have. But uh, so the idea by developing something on the short side, if you can withstand, if you have a positive gain expectancy, a, tra a positive trading hedge on the short side, then the long side is easy. To give you an analogy, I always like to vulgarize and talk and talk about real life example. Mm -hmm. I mean, for instance, Joël Robuchon once mm -hmm. he was criticized that oh. Yeah, okay, you can do your Michelin star because you have the best ingredients, but can you do something else? And he said, fine, and he, made, and he started making hamburgers. Now, moving from three stars to hamburgers, he could do it. But, I, but I'm not entirely sure that every Burger King employee can, who flips burgers can start, go out and do some Michelin star type of cooking. Yeah. If your system works on the short side, it will work on the long side. Now, another thing about this, 
something that I've noticed with a lot of strategies, people have some some criteria on the long side and a different set of criteria on the short side. If you develop your strategy on the short side and then translate it into the long side, you then have an unambiguous system, which means that the, what is valid on the short side is only valid on the short side, and what is valid on the long side is only valid on the long side. If you have two, st- uh, two set of criteria at one point, it's not about if, it's about when, they will conflict. You, you will have the same entry possible on the long side and on the short side, or worse even, if you're in a position, the adverse signal will come. Now, what do you do? And this is not the type of question you want to find the answer when the time comes. So you mentioned uh, some issues with the execution of short systems, for example, the uptick rule and borrow availability. So how do you account for or cope with these challenges when a backtest says that you should have gotten into a trade, but you realistically couldn't? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, well, as a, as a rule of thumb, I mean, first of all, uh, I use the I use the market data explorer. So... As a, as a professional, I naturally weed out all the stocks that have a borrow utilization that are heavily shorted. I mean, it's, this is a, the pro, I mean, the, the heavily shorted stocks are the province of uh, fundamental guys. And they are like, yeah, they are structural short. Structural shorts, they are a dime a dozen. Profitable uh, structural shorts are the unicorns of short selling. So I weed them out. I don't want to touch them. As a matter of fact, I have a rule. As soon as uh, short utilization reaches 55%, I just close the position. Thank you very much. It might go down to zero. Congratulations, but it will be a very bumpy ride. So I naturally weed out all the stuff that is not that is uh, not borrowable. Okay, cool. Now, you also mentioned that uh, the behavior of some instruments on the short side is very different in regards to volatility and things like that. So if you're looking for symmetry and rules, how do you account for that? Um, those different characteristics between the short side and the long side? Uh, that's, a ve- that's a very good point, actually. Uh, well, it primarily relates to stop loss and position sizing. Um, the, the difficulty on the short side is when you have uh, when it works, it shrinks. I mean, and this is very important. Yeah. If you're if you're a short seller, the first thing you need to worry about is not about getting idea and idea generation. That is not the problem. The first thing you need to worry about is risk management, because if it works, it shrinks. If it doesn't work, it balloons. So you have more of something you don't want, and when it works, you have less of something you want. Plus, if you look at the hedge, the long and the short book hedge, then if it works, it shrinks. So it means you consistently need to top up, and you consistently need to come with idea generation. So what happens then with a lot of fundamental guys to, uh, to, uh, to cope with that kind of problem, what they do is actually they oversize their shorts. Now, if you oversize something that is by definition volatile, what happens is you actually, what is big is you have the, vol- the volatility of any portfolio is driven by the big position. So the short side is big position, big volatility. Big volatility on the short side, it means big volatility overall. So the volatility of an overall portfolio is driven by the short side, which is something you want to avoid. So position sizing is absolutely critical. Now in position sizing, the second thing you need to learn about so, about the short side is stop loss. Stop loss is the, is the second most important component in any trading system. And I will prove it. Trading hedge, gain expectancy is win rate times average win minus loss rate times average loss. Now, this, the stop loss is the thing that will have an influence on the loss weight and the win rate. The tighter the stop loss, the lower the win rate and the higher the loss rate, but also it will have an influence on the average loss. Mm-hmm. So the only thing that it has no impact on is the average win. Well, nobody has an impact on it. I mean, as far as I know, nobody can predict tomorrow's weather or tomorrow's close. So. Stop loss is very important. An analogy for that is, would you drive a car without brakes? Probably not. So would you buy a strategy without a stop loss? <laughs> <laughs> I met somebody who said like, yeah, I don't believe in stop loss and I double down each time. And I told him like, yeah, you know, it's called Martingale and Martingale has a very interesting probabilistic property called certainty of ruin. Think about it. <laughs> 
<laughs> casinos, they have marble, gold, master paintings, and so on and so forth. And most rookie gamblers, they go broke. There's a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if I can just jump back to a statement you made about sure. um, finding ideas for short candidates, is it, is it difficult to find short candidates in a bull market? All right. It's a very good question. Now, I mean, let's say, for instance, you're doing stocks. Uh, I mean, because stocks is fairly easy, so fairly easy to understand. If you're doing stocks, I mean, if you're doing an absolute, it, you find it very difficult because in absolute, you want a lot of, there will be very few candidates. However, what you can do and what you should do is divide the OHLC, which is the absolute price, by the close of the index. Mm. And then if you do it in relative, then you have roughly the same number. So then the alpha is generated by the relative outperformers on the long side and the relative underperformers on the short side. So in the bull market, if you want to keep your net exposure, net exposure is the long, the long market value minus the short market value. With this, you can actually collapse the uh, realized volatility of the portfolio and you can derive alpha ideally from both sides of the book. Mm, that's an interesting idea actually. So if you're looking at it in a in a relative context, then do you need to think about stops and things like that also in a relative context? Uh, yes, yes, yes. The only thing that, and also uh, you can include Forex within that. Let's say for instance, you're doing multi-countries. Let's say for instance, you're doing Asia X or Pan-Asia. Then you also have to factor in um, factor in currency. I'll give you a very good example about that. Mm. I mean, back in, I think it was in 2013 or something like this. A friend of mine is having a, a party, and he and there was a there was a very interesting gentleman there. He said, "Yeah, I do uh, pairs fundamental, and I do cross country." So yeah, 2012, and the guy went short Mazda because it was a bad company, and he went long Toyota, which because it's a great company. Mazda went up four times. Toyota went up 30%. And he was doing it in US dollar. Hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work. And then I told him, and he said, no, don't worry. It's small, so it doesn't hurt. And I told him, well, if it's too small to hurt, do you think it's big enough to contribute then? <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're not Facebook best friends, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I think I, um, I think I read somewhere, perhaps it was on your w website, that you said trading the short side is a different mindset. What do you mean by that? Uh, it's it's a very different mindset. I mean, for instance, the first thing about the short side is that there's an asymmetry of information. I mean, everybody wants to go along, everybody wants to buy. So, being a short seller is very healthy uh, in a sense that actually, um, yeah, it's very critical. It. Um, actually, how can I say that? The first thing that is important about being a short seller and, talk, and coming back to stop loss, in my world, what separates the kings from the boys, I mean, what separates the men from the boys is the ability to set a stop loss and the ability to honor them. If ever you want to hire a short seller into your short seller, ask about the stop loss. And uh, this is a very important thing. And what is very important also about being a short seller is you need to accept to be wrong. The key to making money on the short side and also on the long side, if it works on the short side, it will work on the long side. The key to make money on, this, on the markets is to accept to be wrong and move on. Now, there's a subset of the population to whom it comes natural. And these are married men. Guys, it's okay, you're wrong. Just move on. <laughs> we all can relate with that one. So do you, uh, I think you might have touched on this already, but do you find it's easier to develop short strategies in certain markets than others? Uh, well, trending markets are, I mean, trending markets are obviously good. Example, I mean, in, the, in Europe and the US, I mean, they've had spectacular trending market for, it's been a very long bull market. In a way, it's fairly analogous to the bull market that happened from 32 to 37, 1932 to 1937, the, the first onset of the Keynesian market. So it's been very long. And then if it goes up, it will probably tank at one point. Difficult markets, but markets where you can make money are, for instance, sideways bear market like Japan. It's, uh, it's very good for people who practice mean reversion. Uh, for trend followers, uh, sideways markets, I mean, it's, they are they are fairly difficult. Uh, commodities that they, they've been spectacular, uh, spectacular markets. These days, I'm trading forex auto trade on five and fifteen minutes. So we're looking at trends 
same st- same style of trends, but on smaller time frames. Mm, okay. So if traders wanted to build a short system, what tips would you give them to uh, to get started? All right. Uh, uh, first, the first thing that is important is to think about your objectives. What is it you want to accomplish? Who is it for? Is it for you? Is it for institutional level? Is it for what type of what type of uh, target do you have in mind? What what exactly are your objectives? Is your objective hedging? Is your objective generating alpha? Do you want to attract institutional investors and so on and so forth? So what are your beliefs? How much do you think you can generate? So starting with the, the philosophy, at the end of the day, any trading system is, the, is an extreme formalization of beliefs and habits. So start with this in mind, the broader picture. And um, actually, uh, I mean, one of... M- one of the things I love to do is about, uh, study uh, effective neurosciences, but that's a that's a whole different l- uh, topic now. So starting with the big, broad picture, the second thing that is important to do is then focus on the money management, the position sizing. I mean, I came across, I forwarded you something about convexity. I mean, thank you. By the way, thank you very much for the Larry Williams and Ralph Fiennes interviews. <laughs> because I, I've been toying with, uh, with position sizing for years and years and years, and he said something, I mean, Larry Williams said something that people either are too conservative, either they're too racy. And I thought, is there a way to actually marry those two? And I've been toying with formulas and uh, it just came across. And the next day I woke up and I look at my desk, oh, what's that Vega formula doing here? And I realized it's actually the, the position sizing that I've been using. And it's been doing very, very, very well. So well, actually, I named my company after it. So <laughs> different story. <laughs> but... So very important to think about the position sizing, the risk management. Think about this. Clarify this first. And then the third thing that I would think about is exit. Now, exit, I mean, everybody talks about entries and so on and so forth. But exit are very important. Exit is really when it moves the needle. I mean, you can't achieve superior performance simply by good entry. You have to get off at one point. Once you get in, getting out is a certainty so you might as well give it a lot of thought and there are three types there are basically three types of uh, of exit and what is important the way to move the needle is not to consider a trade as 100 percent in 100 percent out the first thing you want to do as a short seller typically a good tip is every time you feel good about your short it's time to cover that's the best tip ever follow that every time it feels good cover half how do you quantify that though (laughs) <laughs> ah, that's a very good point actually I used to cover half so the idea there is I get on I, I set a stop loss I get on it reaches a target price at which point I cut half of the position because there's no matter what the short squeeze is going to happen next and usually the price recedes and when the price movement goes against you whatever the chatter got whatever, however you felt good it really gets destroyed it really erodes the emotional capital so if you cover half the position, then you break even on the train, on the trade. The trade recedes, it goes up and up and up, short squeeze goes back down again. All right, short squeeze over, get back on the train and give it another round. So it's a series of scale out, scale in and scale out. You get in, cut half the position, scale out, oh, goes back up, get back in. Half, and, uh, half the position off and so on and so forth. So the idea is that actually it's a very simple equation. It's a very simple algebraic equation to calculate the, the break even. Let's say for instance, um, I mean, let's say for instance, the, you enter at 100, 110, at 100 and, and uh, at, at 90 you cover half the position, no matter what happens on the remaining half, you will break even. So very simple uh, algebraic uh, equation to solve. So that, that's what I would do. Focus on the exit. And after that, you can focus on the entry. One thing I wouldn't do, and a lot of people like to do that, is when they, they start to short when it breaks support. On the technic, I mean, a technical analysis, it breaks support, then they start to short. That's usually a very bad idea because the probability of success, this is a, this is a classic turtle trading. And I've tested this, and the win rate is actually fairly good on the long side, but on the short side, it drops by 2 3%. You might think it's not... It's it's nothing, but it's something that sets in called trading fatigue. You will be retested, and you will have a lot of false positives. One thing that I've learned about uh, about exit is how you superior performance is achieved by looking at false positives or near misses. In psychology, that's very interesting. 
uh, addicted gamblers, the difference between a gam- between somebody who goes to the ca- to casino or leisurely and somebody who goes professionally is how it, it triggers the brain. And addiction, addicted gamblers, when they have a near miss, when they just could have won, it triggers the same dopamine re- uh, miss Olympic reward circuitry as a win. It's very interesting. And if you can reduce your near misses, your near losses, mechanically your win rate goes up. Mechanically, your performance goes up. And this can only be achieved through exits. So coming back to them, number one is stop loss. Stop loss, you don't negotiate. When you see Marcellus Wallace crossing the street, you don't want to run into his truck. He will go get medieval <laughs> on you. <laughs> but Marcellus wins. <laughs> So, stop loss, you don't negotiate with them. As a matter of fact, if I had the choice, I would fire somebody who doesn't honor stop losses because it sets a new neural pathways. It creates a new habit, and it's a bad habit. So, stop losses, you don't negotiate with them. Second thing is actually uh, partial exit. The idea about partial exit, whether you trade lean hogs, whether you trade a German boons, or whether you trade colorful language with your significant harbor, you trade one thing, it's called risk. <laughs> so the first thing you need to do on the short side, particularly, you need to reduce the risk. So partial exit, that's one. When you reduce, when, as soon as you take money off the table, you reduce the risk, you increase your PNL, you increase your equity curve. Another, the third one is a timeout. Every now and then, you get into something and it doesn't go anywhere. Now, interestingly enough, and I've looked, I mean, when I was at Fidelity and in my other job, in my other previous hedge funds as well, I've looked at the performance of people and I've realized that actually, I mean, if you take out the three best performers, not everybody would outperform. But if you take down the three worst underperformers, everybody would be the benchmark. That's before cost, of course. So exit are very important. Second thing that I realized is actually it's difficult to get in, but once some positions are in there, we rationalize them being into the portfolio. That is, there's a lot of, there's a big magma of stuff that doesn't go neither here nor there and how to deal with them. So the idea for that is you need to deal with them on the, on the X axis, on the time axis. If they have stopped contributing after one third of your average turnover, cut them in half. Don't negotiate. Just cut them in half. Remember, every time you say yes to a loser, you say no to a winner. Another interesting observation about um, about uh, looking at the portfolios of generations of fund managers is very interesting. I mean, particularly at Fidelity, I used to run my my algo across the everybody's uh, portfolio, and I used to show the results. And it came and it dawned upon me one day that actually, within the top ten bets of people. Because of the, I mean, uh, they all have access to the same idea generation, the same very good quality research and so on and so forth. So there tends to be a lot of replication, not necessarily straight off replication, but the same ideas tend to percolate within the top 10 holdings of a lot of some perform of some managers. So, but what was interesting is that actually there were disparities in performance and volatility of performance. So if everybody on this roughly the same stocks, the difference that made the difference is not the stock picking per se, because everybody on the same stuff and given the size of fidelity it was probably the same stuff on everybody, but um, it was the position sizing. And it was really, uh-huh, it was a big aha uh-huh moment, the, the size of the bet. Yeah. So sorry, we're jumping back and forth. And uh, the, final, <laughs> the final point about the exit is the exit in full. Now, exit is a binary thing. Either you make money or you, or you don't. The difficulty is to say goodbye. And that is very, very difficult. And if you don't know where you're going, if you haven't set your criteria, as you can't get on the bus and, eh, well, I'm going to get on after, at some point. You have to know what type of exit you're looking for before you enter. And to give you a very simple example, I mean, um, I, I originally do a lot of quants and I like quants and something that a lot of quants love to do is factor decay. Like they look at certain factors and then they analyze it over mm-hmm. however long. 
And uh, what it was interesting is I eventually asked them, like, OK, that's fine. So you're looking at factor decay over a certain period of time. But tell me, you have a family, you have a car. Do you get on the highway and drive off after three hours? No, it doesn't make sense. So time in itself is an illogical way to look at it. You don't, nobody comes and taps on your shoulder after 199 days because it's about to cross a moving average of 200 or whatever. But build a logical case for your exit. For me, it's very simple, but it's very important. The main difficulty is that people overstay their welcome. Because if contrib- stocks have contributed a lot, they fail to exit properly and they give back a lot. So that's my piece on exits. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a question on exits. How do you actually test uh, an exit without having a defined entry? That's a very good question. So Tombasso had a very interesting way. I mean, at one point, he used to work with Ventar, and he did a random entry. So actually, random entry is the best way to look at it. So that's what I did, actually. Uh, the, the, The classic, the conventional wisdom is that actually, oh, yeah, well, if you don't enter properly, therefore, you can't really test your exit. Therefore, focus on the entry. That's a bit of a circular argument. But random entry is the way I would I would look at it. So then it's a very binary thing. It's, you just have a Boolean random and you enter at any point. That is very brutal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. I just want to jump back to short selling for a minute. So from time to time, the regulators decide that they're going to implement or change some rules to reduce the impact of short selling on the markets. What do you think about that? And what do you think the impact is when they change those type of rules? All right. I think, I mean, uh, that's not going to be politically correct. Uh, I think that the most idiotic uh, decision of all times was to ban short selling in 08 on financials. Um, it, th- I mean, all those uh, uptick rules and so on and so forth, I think they, they are more populistic. Uh, people misunderstand the, the role of short selling. We're not out here to, we're not vampires. I mean, as a matter of fact, short sellers are your pension fund's best friend, are your retirement money's best friend. Because you know what? Markets go down 50%. They do. And if you have a mutual fund that has outperformed by 2%, congratulations, you've just lost 48% of your, of your wealth. So you need short sellers. It's a bad idea to go after them and to lambast them as speculators. I mean, we're not we're not the ones who, who mismanage stuff. I mean, guys like um, the guys at Enron, the guys at Lehman, they're perfectly egotistic enough and hubristic enough to drive their businesses into the ground. We're just here to keep the score and to keep people honest. And it was a bad decision to actually ban short selling on financials because it failed to find a clearing price. That's just that simple. It's, I'm not going to make many friends on that one. Okay, how about we move on then? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I guess when you're studying or developing strategies for a particular market or style for a while, you start to get a feel for it. And with you working so extensively on short systems, you must have had some interesting insights on bear markets. And I think you've, uh, you've kind of touched on a few already, but are there any others that you'd like to share? Yes, um, there are three the three wrong questions to ask yourself when you when you're going through bear markets, and there are three good questions to ask yourself. Three wrong questions is I mean think of bear markets as the winter of stocks. It's just like winter, and winter is like is after autumn and is before spring. So what, and the the first bad question is why is there a bull market? Why should there be a bear a, a bear market? Well, it's like winter, you never really ask yourself why, but it just sort of happens. <laughs> You're wasting time and energy on trying to find out why. It's irrelevant. It happens. It's bound to. It has happened for thousands and thousands of years, and it will continue to happen. So that's a waste of energy. The second thing is, um, all right, so how long is it going to last? Now, interestingly enough, and this is, uh, again, this is another bias that we have, People never really worry about how long do bull markets last. They only worry about how long, bear, and you see a lot of quants and a lot of people like trying to roll out, oh, this bear market has lasted 
17 weeks, 20 weeks, and so on and so forth. So just worry about when is it going to end? When is it going to end? When is it going to end? That's also an idiotic question. Look at Japan, 25 years. Congratulations. Third bad question is what should I buy? Again, bear markets are the winter of stocks. So if you're wondering, well, what kind of bikini should I buy? Okay, cool. That's a great question, but you're probably going to feel uncomfortable mm. <laughs> in mid-January. Oh, I mean, for the for people in Northern Hemisphere in mid-January, you're probably not going to feel comfortable in August for Oz. So, but the three good questions is, bear markets happen. Now, do I have a system that tells me, okay, now this is time to go bear? Do I have a system that identifies that? And you're not going to identify this by listening to the press. The Cassandra's of all times. I mean, this is not going to happen this way. You need to find it in your system, particularly because it's going to be very noisy. Um, I did something about the Kubler-Ross uh, psychology about this. Uh, it's also, I think it's on my website. So you need to have a system that actually tells you, okay, now it's time to switch to bearish mode. Now, the second important question is, do I have a system that enable, that protects my capital and enables me to make money in bear markets? And the most important question is, do I have a system that tells me, all right, now it's no longer time to be bear market. Now this is the spring of stocks. And why is it the most important question is because at the around, right around the bottom, it's a complete waste to try and time the bottom, by the way. It's a complete waste of time. The most expensive 5% is always the last 5%. I mean, fortunes have been lost on the last 5%. I'm not trying to try and time the bottom. It's a waste of time. But you need to identify... Okay, now it's time to slowly dip in on the long side. It's very important because you'll be bared up right around the time, right around the deepest, the end of the bear market. This is where the news flow is horrible. This is where everything's falling apart. And very often stocks start to rebound quite interestingly around that time. So these are my three observations. Also, another thing about bear markets, I mean, uh, Larry, and this is where I probably, I mean, this is where. Uh, American bear markets, like Larry Williams described, differ from uh, other type of bear market. Like he described, the uh, oh bear market really like it's over a week and then it moves on. It's probably happens in trending markets, but in Japan it just falls flat and stays there forever. Very very different style of trading. It's very thin volume. It's uh, it's erratic kind of trading, which is good for mean reverting people, but for trend for trend followers, it's it's catastrophe. Okay, and so in your research, have you found anything in particular that is useful in identifying bull and bear markets? Um, uh, this is an excellent question. Personally, I mean, uh, with the stuff that I do, I've graduated from any indicator. I don't use complicated stuff such as moving average. Uh, I don't use indicator, I don't use oscillator. What I've come to realize is actually in sideways market, they stop working. So all the money that you've made on trending market and up and down trending markets, you tend to give it back in sideways market. So the stuff that I use is simply very simple. It's higher highs, higher lows. Hmm. When something wants to go up, it makes higher highs, higher lows. That's it. When it wants to go down, it makes lower highs, lower lows. Another thing that also that I found is on the short side, sorry, I'm jumping topic here, but on the short side, the mindset is different in a way that people actually want to mean revert. They think that, oh, it's gone up a lot, therefore it should tank. It's not the way to organize it because it's trend following on the long side and they're mean reverting on the short side. This creates an imbalance. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is because people go about RSI or... MACD, like RSI for overboard, or MACD divergence, and so on and so forth. It doesn't really work that well. MACD has a win rate of about 35%. It's more a continuation signal than a, than a reversion system. And RSI, you actually want to short the low RSI because it says relative strength. So you want a short stuff that mm. doesn't have much strength. Makes sense, right? <laughs> Am I missing something here? <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, Shorting also on the, there's also something that is a kind of interesting. Shorting on falling uh, earnings momentum doesn't really work because it's a it's very much a lagging indicator, so it doesn't really work that well. You can short on stagnating uh, falling uh, stagnating EPS, but shorting on on uh, 
The reason for this is, and this is something that I've noticed in my research. I mean, when I did the five stages of Kubler-Ross, like uh, what's that? Uh, denial, anger, uh, and so on, so forth, and the the market signature for each one of them. Each one has a very specific market signature. I came to realize that actually falling EPS is a lagging signal, and this is where all the the classic quants they see oh falling EPS, and then they all jump on board, and then stocks get really crowded and gets really messy very quickly. Not an interesting market mm. for me. Okay, so I'm sensing a theme here that you like to keep things pretty simple. And uh, I think on your website, you said complexity is a form of laziness. So why do you say that? Uh, Well, I I think it applies to everything. Um, Yeah, complexity is a form of laziness. It means that, and this is something, I repeat this to myself when I could and when I program, when I write equations or mathematical equations is until I come to something that is simple and elegant enough, I realize that I've not worked hard enough. Example, the stuff that I do has been a journey over thousands of hours of coding, and I did extraordinarily complex stuff. Like, not everybody tries to do about stochastic array of relative PBR, um, currency adjusted. Nobody tries to do that. But I went through that journey. So it's, it's a bit like the great Chinese philosopher Bruce Lee. When he started Wing Chun, he said, oh, when I started, I thought that a punch was a punch. And then he thought a punch was more than a punch. And then when he completed his journey came back to the simplicity of a punch is a punch. And what I've come to realize is all the great traders, and I was talking about this with Charles Faulkner, like we had a dinner with, in Ho Chi Minh City in Saigon with Mike Covell and Charles Faulkner in January this year. And uh, we were talking about this, and uh, he said that all the great traders, all the great investors, they have a simple way to look at the world. They've, they've modeled the world in a simple manner that they can understand. At the end of the day, we do we trade our habits great traders are not smarter they have smarter trading habits and to come back again to simplicity if you haven't found a system that you can explain to a five-year-old or ten-year-old it needs to be simple and also for instance a lot of quants they try to make it very complicated and complex but then it tends to overfit a market and complexity is fragile it is fragile. Look at all the short gamma guys. They make money, make money, make money, lose a fortune. It's complex, it's beautiful, it's elegant, but it's fragile. And when I used to see Quants, like when Quants used to visit me, I always told them this was the first thing, complexity is a form of laziness. And all the half of the papers that they laid on the table just disappeared right away. <laughs> <laughs> Try that. It works. <laughs> okay, that's some um, great advice there. Thanks, Laurent. So um, now I'd like to switch over to Forex because you uh, you mentioned that you trade the Forex market. So why did you choose that market? Oh, it's very simple. Um, it's very simple. Um, I mean, I work with somebody who works for the U.S. Department of Defense. And we just had this idea, like I think it was a, we were at somebody's wedding la- uh, last year. And I said, oh, the guy said, I want to work on the market. Sure, let's do Forex then. It was at that time the only thing I could trade um, uh, on auto trade. I mean, the, the reason why Forex is actually very interesting. This is the only market that trades 24-5. Uh, five. So five days a week for 24 hours. It's extremely deep. There's a lot of liquidity. And you can command high leverage. Mm-hmm. And there's actually uh, there's actually fairly low correlation once uh, across pair. So it's fairly interesting. It's very liquid high leverage and you can automate that through platforms like MetaTrader and it's a very competitive market as well. So we used to trade like what between uh, we used to trade six pairs on 15 minutes and we overhauled the system over the over the summer and we really really pushed MetaTrader I mean we've really bent it we had to rewrite a lot of modules like the position sizing is rewritten there whole bunch of modules and we built a whole bunch of DLLs, very interesting. Uh, I don't think MetaTrader was, like for instance, the scale out, scale in, MetaTrader is not meant for that and how you keep track of all the positions and so on and so forth. But now we trade on a five minute and uh, it's doing well. Yeah, I think there's a perception that MetaTrader is not is really just a, a retail product and it's not very sophisticated. So what have you found? Is it um, is the software platform actually suitable for professional trading? 
I come I come from Wealth Lab. Wealth Lab is a C sharp environment, and it's and is a very thriving community. MetaTrader Four is a fairly ancient form form of platform, so it was a shock, and it's in C plus plus. One thing I can say about Meta, I mean, and it's it's uh, it's a bit pedestrian when it comes to optimization, which is luckily something I don't, unfortunately something I don't need. Um, oh yeah, about simplicity and uh, optimization. Forgot that. Um, so MetaTrader is a bit. Uh, it 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 is complicated in a way that if you're not a programmer, it's going to be very difficult. For instance, in my case, I rapidly gave up and I teamed up with. Uh, with a with a friend now i think it's complete and the, the highlight of our of our week is to look oh yeah dude they took a couple of stop losses oh false alarms they're legit all right back to funny cats on youtube <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so now actually uh, now we're thinking okay maybe we could help some people program and teach them the right concept to how to develop a, a, a real quality product but it's not obvious on me that radar so if you're a professional programmer, if you know what you're doing, and if you have experience in the market, that can be a fantastic program. If you just, okay, I have $500 in my bank account, and I, should I use MetaTrader? I think uh, it's probably not the right way to go about it. If you have no experience coding, if you don't know much about strategy, it really needs to be worked around. I mean, it was our experience. doesn't mean it can't be done, but it's going to take a lot of work. Somebody asked me on Quora the other day, can I develop a system, can I develop an auto trade system on MetaTrade uh, on the side uh, as a side uh, hobby. And I told him, yeah, of course, just as much as you can practice new surgery as a hobby. Well, so that's actually interesting because I think a, a lot of traders have a, a wrong perception about trading. And I think that, that can probably lead into why they they fail, not just in the Forex markets in general, but why, why do you think that traders fail? Ah. Uh. Kahneman Tversky, Kahneman talked about overconfidence and the way people develop uh, their system, they always develop it for what it works. If you want to develop an auto trade system, and this is also one of the tropism of developing them on the short side, you develop it for the time when it doesn't work. That's what you need to concentrate on. Because you know what? When it works, it takes care of itself. So develop for the time when it doesn't work. And always come back to the gain expectancy. Your job is to maximize the gain expectancy. Now, another part that we've not talked about is the psychology behind it. I mean, making money in the markets is an extremely competitive sport. It's a very difficult sport. My belief is that making money is just the barometer. It may, it's a reflection of the inner alignment from the subconscious belief all the way down to the habits. Like you have subconscious beliefs that determines your conscious beliefs, your beliefs determine your actions, you repeat your actions, your actions become your habits. So speaking of which, there's one myth that I'd like to uh, to get rid of. People say, oh, you have to be disciplined. That's a myth. This is not how the brain is organized. The brain doesn't work like that. I mean, very simple example. Andrew, have the discipline to brush your teeth every day. Do you really think you're going to brush your teeth every day? No. But if you inscribe it as a routine, as a habit, then you're going to do it naturally. If you honor your stop loss as a routine and a habit, there won't be decision fatigue. It will become natural. So the inner alignment from the subconscious belief all the way down to the habit. And the psychological work is something that is not done. And also one of the reasons why people fail is because they focus on the wrong thing. They focus a lot on the entry, but they don't focus about what is it once I'm on the bus? Where should I stop? How do I stop the bleeding? Focus on the system on how, how and when it doesn't work. Yeah, okay. So a little bit more on the systems. What, what type of systems have you found work well in the Forex markets? Ah, good question. Um, well, I've readapted my strategy. So I use the same strategy. So the strategy that I use is anamorphic, as in it, it works on any tradable market. So it works on ETFs, it works on stocks, on futures, on whatever. So it's a trend following scale out scaling. Um, what I've noticed that works quite a lot, I mean, it depends pretty much on your time frame, but uh, depends really much, very much on your time frame. Uh, there are micro trends, and our system is geared to capture them. That is like we put a little chip on the table and then we increase the risk as we catch a trend. 
so that even if we stopped out or even if it doesn't make money, we usually close to break even. So we're trying to follow it, but otherwise there are plenty of, uh, I've seen a lot of mini reversion systems. They work until they don't. So a couple of things about trend following and mean reversion. There are only two types of trading. There are two ways you can win a, a game, and uh, either by knockout, either on points. And mean reversion is a, I mean, this is something also that was on my website. As it, it looks like a Moby Dick p &L distribution, like where you have a big bump, a fairly high win rate. But then you have a few tails where it really, <laughs> where it really like, stops working. Like, oh dear, I've hit a high spot. Ooh, Costa Concord. Ooh, 99% win rate, <laughs> one by trade yep. game over. So that's how it works. So the way to measure them is the tail ratio. You look at the left tail and you look at the right tail. That's the tail ratio. Now, trend followers, conversely, um, trend followers, they basically have a low win rate and they, then it stretches over time. So it's an aggregate. It is the aggregate of the losses small enough is it compensated by the aggregate of the winners? So it's a gain to pain ratio. Mm. Now, how do, how do you measure, how do you combine those? And I sh when I showed that to Jack Schweiger, he was like, yeah, yeah, kind of common sense. When I showed that to my boss, he said, yeah, yeah, common sense. Hence its name, common sense ratio. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you multiply the tail ratio by the gain to pain ratio. So basically we'll recapture the tail, it will recapture the, the aggregates and then you really measure the risk. And this is a much more robust measure than the sharp ratio. Sharp ratio is the right mathematical answer to the wrong question, but that's a different debate altogether. Now the common sense ratio, how does it work for instance? Let's say that you have a common sense ratio of 98, but you have a tail ratio of three. Well, you've just found your next mutual fund. As in it works, sometimes it really does work very well, but because of cyclicality and bear market and whatever, it goes out of style then it tanks. And because of the cost, overall, it's negative. It doesn't generate and you're almost underperforming the, the benchmark. Conversely, a lot of the mean reverting, short gamma and so on and so forth, they make 50 basis points, 50 basis points, 50 basis points, and then they lose four or five percent. Then it takes two years to make it back. Game over. So this is why I like the common sense ratio. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so I just wanted to ask uh, one more question before we start wrapping up for today. And that is, uh, for those traders who are looking to get started in Forex, what would you recommend for them? Mm. There are, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of... Uh, the first thing, that, I mean, um, 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 I'm sorry, I'm not going to be... Uh, okay, I'm going to be honest, but it comes from a good place. Don't go out and contract with a programmer right away. Your billion-dollar idea... It, it might be a diamond in the rough, but it's still a block of carbon until then. So don't go out and program it with, there are zillions of guys who want to program it for you and they probably will offer you a, a decent price. But since you don't know what it looks like, a lot of these guys, they don't have desk experience. They've not been on the market. So they may be good coders, but they don't really understand the markets. And uh, those who've been on the markets and can code, you can't afford them anyways. <laughs> so don't subcontract this. I mean, you can't send somebody else to learn swimming for you. Mm. That's it. So you need to learn to swim. There are also a bunch of platforms like uh, Think or Swim, or there's a whole bunch of of, uh, of those platforms. Try and work on those. And the most important thing about forex, the thing that is really critical, is the position sizing, the risk management. I'll give you an example. We trade uh, when we traded uh, 16 pairs at one point. Even we traded 16 pairs on 15 minutes and we had like win rate across the board. We just lashed on something that worked. Even at that point, our margin utilization was 22%. Uh, and we were loaded up to the wazoo. The position sizing was working very well, it was working splendid. We still were very, very, we were under utilizing our margin. And it was really the, the upper max. Even when we now trade at five minutes across, uh, what was the last time? Let me check. 12 pairs, five minute, 12 pairs, we still use our margin utilization less than 50%. So it's like, don't gamble everything away right now. Focus on the money management. Does it make sense? Yeah, sure. So if you're trading 12 pairs or 16 pairs at the same time, how do you manage the correlation? Ah, the good question. Uh, this is done offline mostly. 
So, um, they, I mean, for instance, like, okay, trading uh, e uh, example, like trading uh, EU, uh, EUR, USD or trading GBP, USD is synthetically pretty much mm -hmm. the same. So, they are, I mean, I eliminate some of those pairs. But because of the frequency that we trade them at, uh, correlation ce ceases to be a, a big thing. Okay. I know that there are some traders who will actually use triple pairs, like for instance, they, they you know, EUR, USD, USD, GPY, uh, EUR, and something like this. We don't do that. I mean, uh, we look at everything in its own right, but at, sm at smaller time uh, periodicity, correlation ce ceases to be a problem. Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Um, so let's just start wrapping up for today uh, with a few quick closing questions. Uh, what's the biggest lesson you've learned through trading? Uh, from Tom Basso, uh, and it was really a game changer. He said, like, don't look at this trade. Uh, don't look at any particular trade. Look at look at any trade as hundreds of trades behind. Like, so it's basically focusing from outcome, changing the focus from outcome pro oriented to process oriented. Mm. Yep, that's a, that's a good one too. So another question, what do you think is the most important ingredient to becoming a successful trader? Mm. Uh, oh, it's very simple. It's the ability to, to, to take on losses and move on. Mm. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite trading book? Uh, favorite trading book? Uh, I would have to say The Reminiscence of the Stock Operator. This is something that I read every year. And also the Jack Schwager series. I mean, this is like peeling an onion. You can always come back to them and read them and have a different, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah. oh, there's something I missed. Uh-huh, it's like peeling an onion. It's fantastic. And of course, uh, I mean, but you can listen to his podcast. Uh, Mike Covell is really good. I like the Van Tharp series, but I would have to place uh, Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. At the top of everything. Yep. Okay. Thanks. And what's the best way for listeners to get in touch with you? Well, they can find me on Quora, uh, Q U O R A. Yep. I think yep. Quora. So I answer questions. I help people. I'll try to help people uh, over there. Yep. I have a website called alphasecurecapital.com. Alpha, like as in generating alpha, securecapital.com. Mm -hmm. Or they can find me through uh, Gmail or LinkedIn. Okay. So um, pretty ubiquitous on the social media. Yep, sure. I'll um, include links to those on the website so it's easy for people to find you. And um, so thanks so much for your time today, Lauren. Is, is there anything else that you'd like to mention before we wrap up? Uh, no, um, I think it was, uh, that was, uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. Um, yeah. I mean, thank you very much for having given me this opportunity. I mean, being in the company of such prestigious uh, listeners, I mean, you're doing a fantastic job. I'm a big fan of your podcast. Oh, thanks very much. I appreciate it. And uh, thanks for spending time with us today too, sharing your insights into uh, short selling, bear markets, forex, uh, trading psychology. It's uh, It's been very insightful. So thanks a lot for that and I uh, wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. How did you enjoy that chat with Laurent this week? He shared so much knowledge on short strategies with us that I couldn't go through them all again, but I found it quite interesting that Laurent said, if you could build a positive expectancy system on the short side, the long side will be easy. He actually starts building strategies on the short side first, which I thought was quite a unique approach. One of the other main points Laurent made was the importance of exits. I really liked his quote, you can't achieve superior performance simply by good entry. Which is an obvious statement, I guess, but it's also a good reminder on the importance of exits and how they can impact trading results. There can often be too much focus on entries. If you'd like more info on this week's episode or just have a comment or question, head over to the show notes, bettersystemtrader.com slash 32. You can get all the details there. Anyway, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the chat with Lauren and thanks for listening to Better System Trader. Catch you next week. Thanks for listening to the Better System Trader podcast. The next step is to head over to bettersystemtrader.com for more expert tips, practical advice, and exclusive content. Catch us next time for even more great ways to improve your trading here on Better System Trader. Better System Trader.